It's crunch time for Liz Truss. Subscribe in our flash sale to mark the announcement of the new Prime Minister and get the next 10 weeks of The Spectator in print and online for just £1. There's no commitment. You can cancel at any time. Hurry, though. This offer runs for this week only. Go to www.spectator.co.uk slash sale. Hello and welcome to The Spectator's Book Club podcast. I'm Sam Leith, the literary editor of The Spectator, and my guest this week is the novelist Ian McEwan, whose new book is called Lessons. Welcome, Ian. Now, the lessons of the title, what what are they and how do they shape the book? Well, the lessons really reflect a whole life. So I'm used to using character as a, a method of discussing and reflecting on human nature, and I thought it'd be interesting to do what we all do, is just try and take in our minds... What do our lives amount to? So the lessons are simply hard, hard experience. And Roland has various, not so entirely exceptional, but enough cumulatively to form a narrative that endlessly shifts. And I think that's what, one lesson is the story we tell ourselves is never once and forever fixed. It's a mutable and highly uh, arrangeable story. And so its central figure, Roland Baines, makes many attempts to understand his own existence, to grasp it and then to let it fall from his grasp and then come to other understandings. If you ask someone, what are the lessons of life, you'll just get banalities. This is the problem. I mean, like, be kind or love conquers all or whatever. And yet, surely we must have learned something hanging around for 70 or 80 years. Not easy to pass on. There is a moment right at the end when, when Roland is almost, not quite dead, but sort of ill, and he thinks he hasn't learnt a single thing in life. But that's not quite true. There is something learned. It's something to do with the self, and maybe it's a slow expansion of a tolerance for everyone else too. But I think it's really hard to nail down lessons. I mean, ask anyone what their lessons is. They've very little to tell you that isn't banal. You know, you say it's it's the reach of a whole life. And this seems to be kind of a departure for you. I mean, by your own standards, this is, you know, what's what's another context sometimes called a baggy monster. It's mm. a it's a it's a whole life story. What what was it that made you turn to that? Sometime uh, towards the end of twenty nineteen, I was thinking about the next writing project, thinking more about the shape of it, the idea of of its totality than any content. And I thought, for the next three or four years, I just want to live inside a book in which I can freely raid bits of my own life and intertwine it with uh, entirely fictional events. And I also thought that I would like, as a soundtrack, as it were, of this fiction, not music, but large-scale political events, and, and just reflect on how they penetrate or disrupt or shape in one way or another our private lives I was also aware it was going to be a long novel I've often thought and and written that many long novels don't earn their length so I was very conscious right from the beginning of sorting out some architecture for it so very early on in the first few months I knew that it was going to be in three parts that each part would have four chapters and each chapter would be somewhere between 10 and 15 thousand words long so it really was going to be on a scale. I also had a very clear sense that whatever was thrown up, as it were, in the first two acts had to be addressed in the third. Again, finally, revisited characters, revisited situations, nailed again in different terms. I was very much helped by by the lockdowns. I said to Annalena, my wife, at the end of 2019, I really want to spend all of 2020 at home writing. And it was an amazing liberation to have a diary had nothing in it for weeks, months ahead. That meant seven days a week, hours and hours every day, I could entirely do what I hoped to do, which was to live inside a novel. And the creation of a kind of alter ego in which Roland was me, not me, lived a life entirely different from mine, but lived a life that might have been mine if I'd never found writing and left school at 16 and probably determined in the spirit of the times ne- never to get a job and just hung on in there on the edges, on the margins, doing, you know, 
the kinds of things he does. A bit of journalism for a listings magazine, a bit of tennis coaching, uh, playing piano in a hotel bar, etc. The, the life lived, you know, hanging by threads. Yeah. I mean, one of the really striking things about <clears throat> Roland, and I don't know whether this makes him more of an alter ego or less of one for you, is he's, he's very passive. You know, in contrast to the wife who leaves him very, very early on, he's always saying, you know, he wants someone else to take control, both sexually and in his life. He's, he's you know, longs for things to happen to him rather than actually doing things. I mean, how much was that part of your design? What what were you getting at with that? Well, I think he's passive in the way that many of us are. Very few of us get to take the ruthless decision uh, his first wife takes by simply leaving behind a husband and baby in order to go and become a novelist and then turns out, you know, fulfil her ambition to become a, a very significant novelist. To a very large extent, when we examine our lives, one of the first questions is how much are we in control of it and how much of it is given over to chance? Roland, yes, there's a passive element to him, but on the other hand, in his defence, he's a man who skips out on a tertiary education but then gives himself one by you know, a very dedicated 10-year application to you know, the city lit and evening classes and the Goethe Institute and so on. And also, you know, he's prompted uh, to ferry books into East Berlin. He gets filled with guilt when the people he's ferrying them to get arrested and he goes back to try and find them. He's active in tracking down the piano teacher who abuses him, although he leaves it 40 years. And likewise tracking down his first wife for one last conversation, who's been very much out of his life for one day of drunken sort of exchange. So uh, not entirely passive, but I think, I think he lives in, um, you know, her private's we. I think he lives in that middle of fortune, active in some things, passive in others, rolling along with life. But yes, when it comes to those big events, in his own life, which start with, for him, Suez, but includes Chernobyl and so on, uh, and especially the fall of the Berlin Wall, his sense is very much mine that we are rather like characters in the Aeneid or the Odyssey, the, the Greek gods in the form of Gorbachev, Kennedy, whatever, are shaping these events, and yet they are all too human. They have feet of clay but we're powerless. I mean, we simply live in there, you know, un underneath their toys. Uh, that, that sense of history impinging on it, or, or history shaping the private lives of the people who live within it. I mean, you talk of, about the sort of generation from which Roland and you come as having sort of, I guess, being the boomer generation, being, you know, I think there's a phrase you have, his lot lolled on history's aproned lap. Yeah. yeah, there was a sense that they didn't live through as their parents' generation had the privations of the war. They weren't well, heading heading for what we're heading for now. And it, Roland worries, doesn't he, that that makes him potentially. That's why he didn't succeed as a writer, and his mother-in-law was a better writer than him. She had more subject matter, that's for sure. Although yes. he he also has to concede that her sentences, Alice's sentences, are better than his own. Well, like most people, he's not a great writer. As for that generation, my generation, yes, I think we did loll on history's aproned lap, endlessly expanding opportunity. I was the first in, in my family, not only to go to university, but to stay on at school past 16. Through the 50s and 60s, everyone was generally getting more and more prosperous. TV sets and washing machines and people buying their first houses and cars. Rock and roll and paperback books, etc., and a kind of freedom that made us, I think, looking back, I, a little too contemptuous in that, those early years of our parents' generation. They had looked into the abyss, and so mowing the lawn and washing down the car on a Sunday afternoon, all the ordinary things of life were exaggeratedly precious to them and became immensely oppressive to us. So yes, being an army kid too, the shadow of the war seemed all the more well-defined and probably cast longer. 
But at school too, all the teachers who taught or taught us were all men entirely shaped by the war who expected to be entering a silent class. You know, there was no issue of discipline, as I remember. But nor did it seem oppressive because it was just the fabric of reality. If there was a bit of commotion, it could be still by sarcasm, not by violence. The decision to give Roland so much of your own biography, I mean, to make, you know, he's obviously mm-hmm. an alternative character. Did that, I mean, I, I wonder what that, in terms of gravitational pull on the narrative, in terms of the sort of risk it might have, I mean, how, how do you negotiate that? Do you just make as free as you like with it? Well, I've always admired those writers who plunder their own lives so freely. I'd always been very much on the side of invention. I always thought that life, drawing from life, was rather cheating. So I allowed myself the kind of luxuries that Dickens had. I mean, Dickens plundered his own childhood. How many times? Seven, eight, nine novels? (laughs) Relentless. I didn't have a blacking factory to fall back on, but certain events that were formative... And I dipped in and out of it, really. Very rapidly, Roland's life diverged from mine. So I gave him my childhood, especially in North Africa. My family background, definitely. The sadness in my family, the secret of a child given away, a baby, on Reading Station. And the, the suffering, so I understood in retrospect, that fell onto my mother and all that. All that was there, but at the same time, the three important women in Roland's life, his first wife, Elisa, who's German, goes off to be a novelist, his second wife, Daphne, who he takes a long time to decide to marry, and, crucially, Miriam Cornell, the piano teacher. They're all entirely inventions. I mean, they bear no resemblance to anyone in my life. So braiding them it felt just like the braiding of all experiences that takes place in the, in the writing of a novel. I don't know if there were any dangers in it for me, particularly. You make a point of including a disclaimer at the back saying Miriam Cornell does not exist. You know, I wasn't, didn't lose my virginity from my piano teacher. Yeah, well, I was worried that, I mean, in earlier drafts, the village she lives in, I changed, thinking it would be just my luck if there's a 92-year-old woman who was once a piano teacher at my old school and her lawyers <laughs> are in touch. But by the time I got to the end, I thought all the names, village names around the place are real and it's just crazy not to name it. So, Given that you're, you, know, you have a, quite a considerable profile and reputation, people, you might get people going, well, which of this stuff's true and start rif- rifling through it for the... Yeah, that would have definitely happened if I'd made Roland a writer, a published writer, because then I've had to deal with... So by having him leave school at 16, he steers around the whole cast of my professional life and and my existence, really. So we share no friends, really. It's interesting that your generation or the generation of those friends with whom you're associated have kind of come to the autobiographical novel quite late. You know, I'm thinking of Salman Rushdie's Joseph Anton and The Pregnant Widow and Martin Amos's... Well, Martin wrote Experience a good while back. But yes. That was a straight memoir, wasn't it? Yeah, much more. But still, it used all the tools and techniques of fiction. I think you get to a certain age, you're bound to start making those long, studied, backward looks. It's bound to happen. I've been promising, but not very sincerely, to write a memoir for a long time. And this only partially fulfils it, so I might get back to the other stuff. Roland's life and mine diverged, but there were certain scenes that seemed to me crucial and I knew they would be still a year away before I got to them. And I made a very definite decision not to make any notes along the way. So that when, for example, Roland goes to confront the woman who has groomed him and with whom he's had a, a sexual relationship that lasts between the ages of 14 and 16, when he goes to see her, I had no idea what was going to happen. I mean, I, in other words, I wanted to be Roland and just write my way into the scene. And likewise, when he goes to see his wife again at the end of her life, when she's diagnosed with um, severe illness. So that's when I felt the greatest proximity to the character, when I just had to let myself inhabit his skin. I mean, the, the novel anticipates quite a lot of these questions itself, but 
what happens between, you know, in the, the literal lessons between Roland and the piano teacher with whom he has an affair, which seems to at least very strongly affect, you know, his life? I and mean, it's probably debatable mm. how much it's to blame for some of the difficulties he's had and how much it's, you know, that he, he takes his own control over that. But do you think it's what would be described as abuse or sexual exploitation at this stage? Or is something more complicated going, going on there? I mean, I know you talk about Hmm. Flaubert's education on Santa Montal you know, in the book as a sort of yeah. anticipatory. Well, right at the end, I mean, many years later, Roland thinks to himself that when he goes to see her, that there was an undiscussable subject, which was that there was a very powerful love between them. And I have to be careful writing that because at the same time, I feel that when an adult, that there's no such thing really as a consensual relationship between an adult and a 14 year old. And yet, Writing it from Roland's point of view, he thinks the world's going to end because the Cuban Missile Crisis is going full tilt. He cannot tolerate the idea that he might be vaporised without ever having had sexual experience. So he thinks all the agency is his. Just to come back to your notion of him being passive, he's the one who remembers the extent to which she touched him up when he was only 11. She's become very much ingrained into his masturbatory fantasies. If the world is going to the end... She's the only girl he knows, and he's round at her door, and, of course, she's waiting for him. But the experience is so sharp, so deep, at just a sort of sensual, tactile level, that 50 years later, he's still reflecting on trying to get it again, to try to restore it, try to have it... And it's not as if he wants to be a serial philanderer. He wants the ultimate dreamlike monogamy in the clouds, as it were, with every woman he meets. And it's not long before they step back somewhat horrified and make their excuses. And that's why, I mean, just to come back to an earlier question of yours of why do the whole life, I could not have somehow got to all these points if I hadn't had the leisure and opportunity to let it span, let him change, let him reflect. And also... I guess this comes back to all those discussions of free will, the extent we are, are just you know, piles of contingency. If your mother and father had made love 30 seconds later, you'd be an entirely different person. And anyone who has more than one child knows this, because they come out differently. <laughs> <laughs> so chance is a very big thing in this novel. It strikes me that sex and love are, are, are sort of dangerous knowledge in a lot of your books. You know, I mean, right back to the Cement Garden in a very in a most sort of lurid way, but, but yeah. you know, on Chesil Beach, in Atonement. Is that something that you kind of recognise as a as a thread that runs through your work? Well, the love making in Atonement, which is interrupted, still is tender and exquisite realization by both parties, by man and woman, that something they've been denying is now allowed and, and is very tender. In On Chesil Beach, a young man and young woman, both sexual innocents, are profoundly in love. All that gets in the way is sex. And that's largely a cultural problem. I've never had more letters about a novel than On Chesil Beach, I have to tell you. I remember giving a reading at the Cheltenham Festival in a theatre, and a, a man stood up and said... Well, this story really resonates with me because just last week I had my 30th anniversary, wedding anniversary with my wife and she reminded me of our wedding night. He'd got so drunk at dinner that he'd gone upstairs to lie down on the bed and didn't wake up till the morning. Only that last week his wife had told him that she'd gone down to the bar and picked up the first guy she could find and had an incredible night of sex. And I said, why are you telling us this? <laughs> and are you still together? At the same time, I was thinking, yeah, I could have written that story too, but too late. But many, many letters were all about how cultural views of sex have complete, or Christian views of sex have completely robbed people who are clearly in love of closing the circle and having what is clearly the highest, moment, I think, of adult life, which is to make love to someone you love and who loves you. I mean, some people make the case for skiing. 
<laughs> and others for cocaine. And I, but I think that, which you know, makes up a lot of literature, not only having it but losing it or never getting it, is probably three quarters of English literature. <laughs> In terms of your own body of work, I mean, there are all sorts of, it strikes, I think, a lot of critics, of sort of swerves and hinges, you know, periods of your work that seem to be one sort of thing. And then you do something completely different. Do you look back and see those swerves and hinges or does it seem to you more more of a kind of complete body? Are there, are there sort of through lines or things you see, preoccupations you see holding it together? To me, it always seems like all swerves and hinges. I leave quite a bit of time between books. I'm very good at not writing. And by the time I start again, it feels sort of like writing my first book once more. But whatever you do, and however different it is, there are always people out there ready to connect it up to everything else you've done. So, you know, there's no escape. The novel is a very personal form. You cannot escape the self. And Kingsley Amis used to say, you can't write 500 words without giving yourself away completely in prose fiction. It is curiously intimate. And long ago, when I was writing Atonement, and there's a little girl, Bryony, 13-year-old, she found it deeply embarrassing to write, he said, or she said, even getting over that barrier. If I say, I know just what she meant, <laughs> it's rather ludicrous. <laughs> but there's an embarrassment to it because it's so personal. You cannot say to your best friend, oh, look, don't take this personally, but your novel is crap. Because... You can only take it personally, which is why I don't read reviews. Good I mean, the question of the art being good, you know, one of the themes of Lessons is this question of how much, how ruthless an artist can be with their own life in order to make, you know, the perfection yeah. of the work. And Elisa does that. But you, 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 you bring in subtly the sort of Robert Lowell question of the the dolphin you know when yeah. Lowell wrote a, a I, th I kind of agree with some of your characters wonderful book of poetry in which he <laughs> sort of collaged and plagiarized and altered the letters of his yeah, you know, uh, ex-wife Elizabeth Hardwick whom he'd left yeah. to write these poems where do you stand yourself on the question on the dolphin <laughs> question was that grotesquely cruel or was that just worth it for the art I think it's been grotesquely cruel should never have happened and it's a brilliant book I mean and we're left you can't resolve it some really shitty people have written wonderful books some people with nasty political ideas paint great paintings so I don't think that's we were ever going to resolve that what we don't want to do is tear down all the statues that's clear we'd like to think that the whole moral being is involved in a book and therefore a bad a really bad person couldn't write a really great book but there's it's amazing how this conversation has gone on all my life. So the last time I had it was only 10 days ago with the German novelist who's coming to stay, Daniel Kahlen. Could a Nazi write a great novel? And we decided in the end that he couldn't. But I felt we were letting ourselves off the hook somewhere there because it doesn't seem completely impossible. Does making Elisa a toweringly great European writer, I mean, what made you do that was it was that making it easier for her to do what she did I mean if she'd gone off and been a failure how would that have affected the shape of your novel uh, yeah I think it would be very satisfying for Roland when he's in Berlin the wall is falling she's they've met in a in the rain in a little alley and just into the east and she takes out of her bag her bound proof of her first novel and he takes it back to his hotel and to his horror he thinks it's a masterpiece so, I mean, the answer to your question is I wanted to make things as difficult as possible for Roland. <laughs> his fury at her leaving and his awe at what she produced and his uh, having to acknowledge that she never could have written such a book had she stayed in their cramped little house in South London. And that ambivalence is we just have to carry it. Again, if there's a lesson in life, nothing is solved. We all hate that word, closure. Either you, there's a massive forgetfulness in all of life's problems or you've just carried it along with you. It just becomes part of what you have and what you have to think about. So uh, it was irresistible to make her a very important writer um, <laughs> because he would have to go on reading her all 
all her life, all his life. I wanted to give, let Alyssa give a little tutorial on how to read a novel at the end because he's finally crossly identified a character that's him because she set a scene in, the, in that squalid little house but she's made that man physically abusive. So he confronts her about this and says, and I guess she was, as you picked up on, we're talking about my own methods. It's my right to take whatever I want from my life and do what I want with it. The character in my novel is six foot three, you're five foot eight. He has a scar on his face. I borrowed that from a Nazi friend of my father. He has a ponytail you wouldn't be seen dead in. And yet you think it's you. This is vanity. And I think we live at a time of heightened love of the subjective in fiction. We get an awful lot of novels in the first person, but I think on the reader's side, there's a pursuit of wanting to find the novel that's about you or that somehow reflects you back on yourself. And I think all those readers ought to go and you know, get back to Borges or Kafka and find themselves totally absent and have wonderful time free of themselves. And that question of the style and the... Uh, you know, the, the worldview of novel. I mean, it strikes me that your work has this, as you know, as you described, there's this kind of tutorial within the novel about how to read a novel with autobiographical elements. You know, there's a very metafictional, postmodern yeah. sort of stripe in your work, or very self conscious about what storytelling does and what its possibilities and dangers are. On the surface, your, you know, your naturalistic detail is really, really to the fore. You'll put in things like the sort of, quiet closure of the rubber door on Elisa's house that seems yeah. you know so particular mm. as to be something that's reported rather than apparently invented I mean do you think of yourself as a realist writer I think my project and I think it's a really interesting question for for all of us readers and writers but my project is to somehow have all the lessons of modernism but all the gifts of the 19th century, of 19th century social realism, but also the elaboration of character that we got, you know, from Jane Austen right through Flaubert, Balzac, Tolstoy, and many, many others, and George Eliot. Why can't we have it both ways? In other words, to be well aware of the process of what you're doing, but have all the fruits of all those techniques, which we did, you know, no writer writing today invented for himself or herself, free and direct style, a wonderful, liberating mode of the third person, allowing you to zoom in and out, colour the world with a person's thoughts. An incredibly sophisticated device that I, I noticed now, well, I noticed years ago when I was reading to my children bedtime, children know how to, they understand it. I mean, they'd be baffled by the term free and direct style, but they know what it, what it's about, how it works, how you can move in and out of... Oh, yeah. It's, it's extraordinary. I remember when I was reading my five-year-old Horrid Henry, he said, no, that's what Henry's thinking, not what... I said, yes, that's the free and direct style he wanted to find. Well, that's amazing. I mean, maybe he should be growing up to be a literary critic because usually <laughs> children are operating it, but they don't... They just inhabit it. How clever of him to step outside it and notice it. Which reminds me that when I was reading a Beatrix Potter, which I loathe, by the way, Beatrix Potter stories, but anyway, children love them, so I read them at bedtime. And in uh, the tale of Peter Rabbit and Benjamin Bunny, who go and steal carrots from Mr. McGregor's garden, when they get back to his cousin's place, Benjamin Bunny gets a sound beating from his dad. And my son, Will, suddenly stopped me and gripped my arm and said... But why is he hitting him? He's his dad. And I realised that he'd <laughs> been born 50 years earlier. You, couldn't, you would not have seen any paradox there. But I was very touched by that paradox. Yeah, so that's a move in the right direction. Anyway, it's helpful to be able to use a detail like the sucking sound of a pneumatic door just to remind the reader of the solid world. And you don't have to go into Balzacian mode and explain and describe the whole street or the whole house or what someone's wearing all the time. Although I've been reading La Cousine Bette recently, and it's far more sophisticated than I ever remembered. I always thought there was something rather plodding about all Balzac's descriptions. They're, they're really extraordinary, beautiful. We can have it both ways. I don't think we can ever get past 
what modernism gave us and postmodernism, uh, it's pointless. But Virginia Woolf was so, so wrong when she pronounced that character was dead. I think novels without characters are just useless. And I think Rob Grier gave a lifetime to demonstrate that. Um. Well, you're also, you know, realism and reality connecting. You're, you're a novelist who's deeply interested in science and science comes in you know, here and there in this book and was sort of slightly haunted by the multiple worlds yeah. hypothesis. Roland doesn't much yeah. care for science. I thought I'd give myself a break. I mean, how, what possibilities do the new ways of conceiving the world that science has given us offer the novelist? Is it kind of a duty to try and address them and take them on board? I'm just thinking recently... I heard you asking the physicist Carlo Rovelli, mm. you know, are we going to eventually somehow internalise yeah. the extraordinarily counterintuitive way in which quantum reality mm. kind of, you know, what it tells us about how the universe really works? Are we going to be able to internalise that in the same way as we internalised heliocentrism or anything else? I mean, as a novelist, do you think that's something you, from your end of things, that you can take on board and use in your practice? I'd love to be able to do it about quantum mechanics, but I just have no idea. I mean, I must have read 40 books on quantum mechanics in the last 40 years, and I don't think I understand any more than... I mean, briefly, I understand things, but I wasn't quite happy with Carlo Rovelli's answer last night because he compared the notion of there being no up or down in the universe, which is quite simple. It's just a binary matter. It is or it isn't. And likewise, the Copernican revolution, I think it occurred to many people, uh, especially in antiquity, that it would still look the same to us if the sun went round the earth as if the earth went round the sun or the, or, or the earth's rotation gave the impression of the sun going round the earth. That didn't seem so difficult. But indeterminacy a photon being a wave and a part of all the rest of it, how we would internalise that, to use your phrase, I've no idea. Because I think we're confined to this this Middle Earth place, you know, and, and it works perfectly well. We evolved in a Newtonian universe. But I was more interested if, in knowing whether Carlo, who understands as much as anyone about this, whether he has a sensual, internalised understanding of of things and I didn't I couldn't I mean it's, it's quite hard in these and also I felt that he was coming close to mental exhaustion he'd been talking about his book all day and I suddenly saw this, <laughs> that some switch go down I thought yeah I think I know I've been there myself on much simpler matters but coming back to science in my novels there are ways of thinking scientifically without even being aware of it and I think most of us do it most of us now have a strong sense of the structure of the solar system, for example. Most of us who at least have some education are aware that we evolve and weren't made in six days. Most people will tell you how far the Earth is from the sun. And also we know that the very big and the very small have... At the very least, most of us know that it's crazy out there, that it's not like common sense. Hmm. So our worldviews are scientific, I mean, on the whole unless you're some sort of Baptist or whatever. And I think the science in my book is simply an extension of my interest in realism. If you want to describe and understand the world, we no longer ask a priest. But also I rather love writing about other people's expertise. So occasionally that's a scientist, but sometimes you know, it could be a, a high court judge or a neurosurgeon or whatever. I mean, at least technologically, maybe, rather than on the theoretical side... You know, one of the received wisdoms of the first half of the 20th century is that, that technological change changed the way we saw the world and kind of forced us into modernism. And do you think that the digital revolution is going to change the shape of the novel substantially or does this modified mm -hmm. legacy of 19th century bourgeois realism still work? I think the realism is bound to have to continue, but it might be describing fundamentally different things. And I used to be very sceptical about whether the digital age was changing us, but I'm beginning to think when we've lived with it for a while, much longer than the odd 30 years that we've had, that it will change us, that the metaverse 
that's coming that might be so addictive and hard to live without. I, I just find in my own... I held out, for example, against a smartphone, an iPhone, for years, because I was aware that people were never putting them down. But then when I got one, I was never putting it down and lived by it and every spare minute looking at something or other. And I think it might have robbed us of the art of solitude. We're so connected now. And it takes a deliberate effort, I think, to turn off. And I, the example I always give is that at the luggage carousel, people have been without the internet for 90 minutes. While you're waiting for that 20 minutes for your luggage to arrive, in the past, what would you do? I mean, a few dedicated people would read a book, but most people drift off in their thoughts and memories. Now we just look to see the 40 emails or WhatsApps that have come in while we've been up in the air and not allowed. And by the way, pretty soon... Well, it's already happened. You won't have that uh, solitude above the clouds. People will be constantly on their phones. But the novel can describe that. The lovely novel by a Dutch writer, Dutch woman. We had to take down this post. Have you come across it? I haven't, I haven't read it, but I've read about it. The subject matter is really interesting. These kids working in a, for a tech company, seeing the absolutely abysmally worst side of human nature. And it drives them all nuts. <laughs> I mean, as a microcosm for all of us, I thought it was rather rather creepy, but convincing. But the novel will, can describe that. I mean, I would make the case for realism that the novel might change its subject matter and human nature might even shift. Again, a, a concept I was thought was ludicrous. Human nature is a product of tens of thousands of years of social and before that animal evolution. But having, having a device, a literary device that can give us the physical world and human subjectivity is invaluable. And I, I don't get it from movies and I don't get it from theatre. Maybe I'll get it from some extraordinary variant of virtual reality. But virtual reality or, or games are still locked into endless violence at the moment. It's just like they're all written by 11-year-olds and it's about zapping people with guns and things. I'm waiting, and people keep telling me, oh, but it's calm, it's arrived, and I go and look and it's not. I'm waiting for something that's got the moral complexity of a Jane Austen or of which you are a part. You fall in love with this girl, uh, you get her pregnant, her father's a monster. I mean, you know, you could be there. <laughs> <laughs> with options. And that will be irresistible. But it will be a form of... It will, it will have to be written. Someone's got to write it. Do you feel yes. anxiety Sorry. at all? Or do you, do you share the kind of widespread anxiety that we're... The freedom of the novelist to be morally dangerous, to think themselves into another person's head, are in some ways under threat from the censoriousness on... Now, actually, not on the right, but on the left, more often, yeah. this idea. I mean, you have Alyssa, for instance, making a J Jermaine Greer style joke about trans surgery on a thought or a yeah. talk show and being sort of counseled. Yeah. Is that that sense that there's a chill on on the freedom of the imagination? Is that something that concerns you? Well, it, it certainly doesn't limit me, but it really concerns me, and I think it's generational. I had a long discussion with Timothy Garton Ash a few months ago. And he said, yeah, OK, generation, but let's pin down the age. And we finally agreed, 35. And of course, there's a bit of blurring around it. But 35 is the upper threshold of the generation? I'd say, you know, if you're talking to someone under 35, they might well never want to mention the word J.K. Rowling to you ever again, however much they were devoted to their books. And what did she do? She mocked in a tweet a clean water charity that seemed to be not wanting to use the word women. It said children, men, and people who menstruate or something like that. And she said, oh, well, what was that word we used to use? Uh, womble or amble? Or, you know, so it was a piss take. And what do we have? Death threats. And no one plays Quidditch in the States anymore. And someone I was talking to just the other day said, oh, it was a journalist. 
saying that his 15-year-old daughter, who, who had read all of the Harry Potter novels and seen all of the movies now, and she's 15, she loathes J.K. Rowling for all the terrible things she did. But she probably doesn't even know what terrible... Well, we do. She was satirical. So, yeah, Alyssa, I associate with the generation of Jermaine Greer, sceptical, second-wave feminists who find themselves constantly on Newsnight battling with some trans activist. And I'm always amazed by it because it sort of makes my heart race. There's something so unexpected about it. Who would have guessed that that generation, which is actually my generation, of women would have their backs to the wall, as it were, being accused of being the orthodoxy that must be overthrown. That's really odd. And the other thing I found chilling was a young novelist on the radio a few months ago saying, he was saying he could not write about male desire. He could see no way to do it. What, without being guilty of the male gaze? That kind of stuff. I think male gaze is old hat now. It's something... <laughs> but, yeah, without objectifying and humbling and humiliating the object of his gaze. I don't know, I like to think this is just a phase we're going through that sometimes I'm at dinner with friends completely relaxed and then I think, but wait a minute, my married friends, they're both men. I'm doing something that 30, 40 years ago would have been impossible, completely impossible, and how delightful. But it's gone beyond that. We just take it for granted now. And in the wake of that, have become all kinds of other demands for other kinds of orientations. And one should think, well, take a Chairman Mao view, let a hundred flowers blossom. But there's this other element, which is the angry, humorless bit of it. That I think might what? just be transitional. You know, we're just... So there are people who don't want to be identified by any gender. I don't have any trouble with that. I mean... So maybe it's just a humanist project that is stumbling towards realisation and we've all got a bit ill-tempered about it. That's my best take on it. Why do you think it's happening? You think it's... Well, I think that. I think we're going through a kind of sexual revolution, but it's, it's not focused. It's spread across all kinds of things. The other thing I think is it's an amazing gift to the right, but not only to the right. I, I listened to an hour of uh, stand-up comedy. I think the older we get, it's harder to make have other people make you laugh, except in conversation. But someone whose job it is to make you laugh, they just don't seem to do it for me anymore. Anyway, in that spirit of wanting to be made to laugh, I noticed that comedian after comedian was mocking this whole business and doing it totally fearlessly and funnily. And, of course, Ricky Gervais does it spectacularly well. You know, no one's killed him, thank God. So... I don't know. I, do we do we need to be depressed about it? No. I I do. I'd feel depressed about it if I really thought that a young male writer could not write about desire. I mean, you might want to bring all kinds of new and modern sensibilities to it. Personally, I think if you're going to write about sex, you've also got to write about emotions. I mean, it's, it, it, there's never just sex. There's all kinds of other things and contingencies surrounding any love making and massive cultural determinants as well. And you need to, you know, you know, be aware of all those things, even if you're not writing it. But it seems to me a terrible muffling, especially in a time when freedom of speech is, you know, around the world is shrinking. That the West should volunteer to start limiting its speech, I think, is really a problem. Well, the the stabbing of Salman Rushdie, obviously, which was extraordinarily sort of shocking. I mean, did you feel that felt almost like a sort of postcard from a previous era of? The suppression of freedom of speech. I don't know. You you know Rushdie, presumably. Are you in touch? Have you heard from yeah. him or spoken to him? No, I'm, I count myself as a close friend. I wrote a bit of. I mean, I had COVID at the time, so it came through as a double shock. I've, well, my skin was thinner, as it were, and I only had time to write a very short piece for the Times. And what I said was that there, there was something nastily consonant with the Times, the attack now not only in the states where lonely, inadequate men went into school to murder children, but everywhere, the ease with which people issue death threats. And there's something nastily consonant about this attack on Salman. Whereas 
in 89, at the beginning of 89, the, the fatwa, we were just at the beginning of an amazing opening out of freedom of expression. Strangely enough, that paradox is, is there, that you know, later that year the wall fell, all kinds of people started saying things they weren't allowed to say before. And it was happening in South America too, and it was happening in South Africa. This theme is particularly nasty, not only because the attack itself is so savage, so hateful, so hate-filled, but because it, it seemed more emblematic of the kind of place the United States is becoming and maybe, you know, what we're all having to live with when come back to J.K. Rowling, death threats are almost the kind of the norm. When she said she was sickened by the attack on Salma, she immediately got a death threat the next day. So, yeah. Well, Mr. Edward, there is a line in the book, which take try and move off from, I was going to say try and move off from something that's that's rather depressing, but there's a sort of wry line in the book where you're you're transcribing a whole series of, of the opinions oh, yeah. um, promulgated at dinner parties, and somebody said, quotes, I think it's the book a shortlist for that year, and says, you know, comfortable white men of a certain age, their time is up. Do you feel your back's against the wall in literary terms as a comfortable white man of a certain age, for the sort who might have been in that group? Yeah, but we had a good time, and I don't think I feel any any great loss or sadness about it. I mean, when we were running around in London in the 70s, it was very boy-filled. We had the time of our lives. I've won lots of prizes. Uh, I don't need any more. And, yeah, let, let as many other voices in as possible. I feel fine about it. I mean, I've had a, we had a good go. How could we possibly complain? <laughs> it's ridiculous. Uh, so as long as I'm not constrained in what I want to imagine and write, then I feel fine about it. Ian McEwen, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Sam. <laughs>